Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to uh, Tuesday. I know you guys think it's Tuesday. And it is Tuesday. Technically, it's Tuesday. I know. But it's not just Tuesday for me. Today is book release day. Today is the day that this book, this photo was taken of me, by the way, about two weeks ago. Stories to Tell, a memoir written by me, 100% by me, uh, is out today. I've been, for those of you who follow me on social media, you know that I've been talking about this for a long time. Um, I don't know exactly how I feel about it all. I'm excited, obviously, but I'm nervous and I'm, uh, I'm full of a lot of different emotions about this. Uh, this has been, um, if I'm being really accurate about it, this has been in the works for probably about nine years. Even before I realized that I was going to write a book, I was sort of mentally writing a book in my head. In that, uh, about nine years ago, I started doing concerts as a solo artist, as a solo acoustic show, which means no band. I'm still playing with my band. I still do play with my band. But I started doing shows alone on stage in theaters uh, where it was just me and the audience. And I would have a guitar and I'd go to the piano and I would sing a bunch of songs. But in between the songs, I started telling stories about my life and my career and things that have happened to me, people I've worked with. And, um, and I made a point to only tell stories that I thought were funny um, because those kind of shows, if you go see a a solo acoustic show and the guys up there, you know, in between songs going, this is what I was going through and I wrote this next, I'm like nobody cares. That's just boring. So I tried to um, focus on stories that were funny, all 100% true. And I'm, you know, I'm 57 years old, but I've, I've, uh, I've lived a, quite a life and worked with a lot of amazing, interesting people and had a lot of crazy stuff happened to me along the way. And so what I realized after a year or two of doing those shows was that every, every get the book if you haven't um if you're interested in getting the book and you haven't ordered it yet there should be a link um below i guess or somewhere embedded here on this video right now live i can click on that and you can get the book i'm going to sign a, these books while we're hanging out for the next uh, however long um daisy was going to kind of be here and feed me questions, but Daisy's got a crazy busy day too. So for those of you who are going, where's Daisy? Daisy's Daisy Fuentes, she's busy. Um, but she has done quite a few little um, promotional things with me about the book. And she might make an appearance, I don't know. She's getting ready to, she's got a busy day today too. Um, let's see, I think uh, what I, before, I'll, well, let me sign a book first. This is all very new to me, by the way. This is all, I'm just winging it here. Um, this is the front cover of the book, Stories to Tell a Memoir. It's the back cover of the book. And there's a barcode that's a, that means it's for real. Like if there's a barcode, baby, that's for real. Um, I have learned, I'm curious about what you guys, what your guys' preferences might be. Like if we were to be hanging out and you, and you had the book and you went, hey, would you sign my book? Would you want me to sign it here? Would you want me to sign it here? Would you want me to sign it? They say that collectors like you to sign it here on the title page. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sign Michael Bolton no, um, on that one. So there's one book signed. 
and we've got a bunch of questions from people all over the world. Um, so I'm going to take a, as many of these as I can get through in our time together. First one comes from Michael from Cocoa, Florida. Your father was a well-known orchestra leader in Chicago. What was it like growing up? Any pressure to join the family business? Well, Michael, my father was a conductor for sure, but he was really, uh, his claim to fame was um, as a jazz pianist in the late 50s and the early 60s, he was sort of like the hottest jazz pianist in Chicago, where I'm from. And he had a huge following there, was very well known. And then around the year I was born, 63, he started his own jingle company. So he wrote the music for television and radio commercials and he produced them and arranged them and, um, and had an incredibly successful career at that for over 20 years, 25 years. And so many famous commercials from two scoops of raisins and a package of Kellogg's Raisin Bran. He wrote that, he wrote, ask any mermaid you happen to see. What's the best tune? I sing it. You can't off the sea. Um, many, many hundreds of famous commercials. And my mother, who had been a big band singer uh, in her life before she met my father, of course, was one of the featured singers on all these commercials. There were a handful of singers in Chicago who did all the commercials. And my mom was one of them. Um, when I was about five years old, I got hired to sing on my first session for a, a commercial for a, a telephone company. They wanted a little kid to sing this jingle. And the reason that my parents got me to do it, my father got me to do it, was not simply nepotism, but ever since I was old enough to make a sound rock, running around my house, I was singing. I was singing and I was singing in tune. So when I would be singing along with monkey songs or you know, hang on Sloopy or whatever song was popular, my parents noticed that I was singing in tune even when I was really little. So it just was a natural thing. So I started singing on the commercials and it was really a family business. When I was older and I was starting to write songs, when I was like 15, 16, there was a moment there where I think my father wanted me to take over his company. And there was, <laughs> there was even a a, a brief period of a couple of weeks where I had an office in his big office building in downtown Chicago. And he assigned me a, to write music to some commercial. I have no recollection of what it was. A shoe company, who knows? And I just remember I tried to write something and it was okay, but I knew that I would never be as good at doing that as my dad. And I just didn't want to be in his shadow. I wanted to do my own thing and I wanted to make records and write songs. And, and so uh, with both of my parents, great support. As soon as I graduated from high school, I went out to LA mainly because and you can read about this in my book if you want. Um, Lionel Richie heard a cassette tape of my first few songs that I'd ever written and the demos of them with me singing them. And he called me up at my parents' house in Chicago when I was a senior in high school and just encouraged me and said, dude, you should move to LA. And that's what I did. So that, that kind of ended the dream of me being a part of the family business and taking over my dad's company, but it worked out. It worked out, my dad kept his business going for a long time. And I went out to LA and started my own thing. So that's question number one. All right, let's carry on. Uh, Paul from West Midlands, United Kingdom. Uh, what are you the most proud of? A song, an album, a big break that you did not expect, your children, your wife, your long and successful music career, and why? That's a lot, dude. <laughs> um, Paul, I'll tell you without any hesitation that the thing that I'm the most proud of is that all three of my sons are good people, good human beings. I don't really take credit for it because nor do I give my ex-wife or mother credit for it, um, mainly because I, I know some really wonderful people, couples who, had, who have kids who are kind of jerks. So I feel like that's not their fault. You know, you're born with a personality. Um, you can certainly f help form your children's personalities, but uh, they pretty much are who they are. 
And all three of my sons, Brandon, Lucas, and Jesse, Brandon's 30, Lucas is 28, and Jesse's 27. Um, I'm seeing them later today to celebrate the release of the book. Um, they're just really good guys and quality human beings, caring, thoughtful, loving young men. So everything that comes after that uh, is kind of pales in comparison. Um, creatively, the, the thing that I always think about that I'm the most proud of, I guess, yeah, is that throughout my career, I'm not known for one thing. I'm not known as just being a pop singer or just a ballad singer or whatever. I, I, I've worked with so many different people and in so many genres, especially as a songwriter. I think the thing I'm the most proud of is that my songs have been successful on the R&B charts, on the rock charts, on the pop charts, on the mellow, easy listening stations. Um, and the fact and country, you know, so to jump around all those different genres uh, is something that is, I think, kind of unique. And it's the thing I'm kind of proud of. And cheers to you. Here's a nice coffee to you. Oh, God, that's good. It's hot here today. And it's very refreshing. Um, Nigel from Flintshire, United Kingdom. Um, do you collect your own CDs and records from around the world? And when is Limitless live stream available on DVD? I don't know that the, I don't know that we're going to do a DVD of the Limitless Live. We might. That might be a good idea. Um, certainly make it available again. Um, that was something that we did recently. I did I did one with my band, and I also filmed another one that's going to be coming out soon. That's very different than that. So that'll be out soon. Um, yeah, maybe we'll put them, make them available. If not on DVD, then certainly, you know, as a um, digital purchase or stream. Uh, do I collect my own CDs? I don't know that I would say I collect them, but I have, you know, I have boxes full of albums and CDs from different parts of the world, especially if the artwork was different, I would probably hang on to them. But they're in boxes in a storage place, you know, they're not displayed anywhere. Or, but I do love when like, especially in Japan, where the, the graphic artists that the record companies there are so talented, and sometimes they would do a totally different um, set of artwork for an album. So that was always cool to see. Um, I can sign another book. So the stories in this book are mainly, most of the chapters are named after song titles. Uh, for instance, uh, Crazy. Chapter five is called Crazy because it's um, about a song I wrote with the great Kenny Rogers when I was 19 years old and it became a number one country singer. And it was when I, Kenny Rogers is the first artist who ever recorded any of my songs. And uh, there's a pretty interesting and funny story about how that all came to be. Um, there's a chapter about should have known better <laughs> that is one of the most personal chapters in the book, even though it, it really is about something that happened to me when I was very young. It was a great life lesson, a painfully learned life lesson about what not to do and, and how to not violate your own integrity. Um, it was a painful experience, but I got a good song out of it. Um, and then, so there were a bunch of song titles as uh, chapter titles, but then there's all kinds of other things. Um, some people was asking me like, what are some of your favorite chapters? One of my favorite chapters is called Oprah, OJ and Me. I can't give it away. I just, you have to, if you wanna know what that's about, you have to read the book. Um, let me do another. Uh, Question. Brad from Ohio wants to know what inspired the song Hazard? Thank you for your music over the years. Thank you, Brad. Um, what inspired the song Hazard? I write about, there's a whole chapter about this in the book, but the Reader's Digest version is 
I was on this long tour for Repeat Offender, my second album, and I was driving across the country. Well, I wasn't driving, I was being driven. I was in the back of my tour bus. And it was about 3.30 in the morning, and I, I, I believe that we were driving through Iowa or somewhere in the Midwest, and, and as has happened to me a few times, I woke up out of a sound sleep with a song in my head. I was dreaming a song. No lyrics, just music. And so I immediately reached for my, I used to carry around these handheld cassette machines just so I'd never forget ideas when I would get inspired. And I sang all the music into this tape machine and then lived with it for a while. And, and the, the music was so, um, it was in a minor key. And the only word I could use is ominous. There was something about the music that felt just sort of mysterious and on, ominous. And, and it didn't sound like a love song and it didn't sound like a, certainly didn't sound like a rock song or a party song. And so, oh, mailman's here. And so, wait, I'm gonna sneeze. I think I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Salute. Um, and so then I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I could write a story? Like a lyric that was a story, a fictional story, a murder mystery to this piece of music. And so that's what I set out to do. And I worked on it really hard. And the more I worked on it, the bigger a piece of crap I thought it was at the time. Um, I thought it was just so dumb. It sounded like a bad Twin Peaks episode to me. But I enjoyed approaching a song and writing a song in a way that I had never done before. So I finished it and I thought, I'll just put it on the album. Um, back then there, were, there was a term called album cut, which meant not a single, not a song that was going to get any particular attention. And uh, much to my surprise, the record company put it out as a single and the song became huge all around the world. Number one in Australia, I think almost number one or number two in the UK. Um, one of the biggest songs of my life. Um, and it was all just this little experiment. And no, I'm not telling you who killed Mary. Uh, don't even ask. Uh, Graham from South Shields, United Kingdom. How did you find the writing process for writing the book differed from your songwriting? Did you find it difficult sharing so much with the public? Uh, good question, Graham. Um, the writing process was night and day. It was really different than writing a song. And, and in a way, writing this book, Stories to Tell, which you can order through the link in this video below, uh, writing this book was a little more freeing. It was a freer process. It was a little more, um, like when I'm writing a song, it, part of it is because I've been writing songs for so long that I've, I have a, uh, a set of, not rules, but the process is such that I have to, you know, I have to rhyme and I have to be concise and I have to like make this part, the verse has to be this. And then the, there's a setup to the chorus and then there's the chorus and there's the payoff. And there's, there's a lot, it's very methodical. In the case of writing this book, it was really just writing the truth. It was just writing what happened in as creative and, and entertaining a way as I could. Uh, so it wasn't really much of a puzzle. When I'm writing a song, it's like finishing a puzzle. It's like finding the pieces to, to solve the puzzle. This was just a matter of diligence. Writing this book was just, you know, sitting down, you know, and a tackling a chapter, tackling, oh, now I remember, oh, yeah, I just remember this thing that happened. When I got held at gunpoint in Taiwan and my agent had a gun to his head and that whole crazy story. So then it was just sort of like writing it down, but I tried to write each chapter in each story as if I were just sitting, having a cocktail with you and talking. Um, so I hope that the people who read the book come away feeling like it's conversational. I really did try to write it that way as if I was just hanging out with you. Um, so yeah, the process was very different. Uh, what was the, wasn't there a second part of your question? Oh, sharing, was it difficult sharing so much with the public? You know, I've always been a very private person. I mean, people don't really know much about me, my life. I've always wanted it that way. I've never been in the tabloids. Um, I didn't ever go to rehab. 
I didn't get arrested. Um, my first marriage lasted 20 years, 20, over 20 years to a wonderful woman. And we just, we just parted ways. And, um, and then I remarried and, uh, there's not a lot of tabloidy stuff to talk about. So my privacy has always been important to me. And so I approached the parts of the book that were personal in a way that I felt was respectful of my own privacy, if that makes any sense. Like I wrote about what I was comfortable talking about and I did not write about stuff that I wasn't comfortable talking about. I also just, okay, this is just me, okay, you guys. When I read someone's memoir and they talk about really personal stuff, like who they slept with or that kind of stuff, I just find it kind of creepy, especially if it's a man. It's not elegant. It's just not an elegant thing to do, to name names and talk about the, the women you slept with. Dang, man, it's not, just not me. So it was actually a pretty easy call on my part. Um, I'm having more fun with this than I thought. I thought it would be weird just us, but it's kind of cool. Um, you have a lot of, oh, this is from Joanne in the Netherlands. You have a lot of stories to tell already. What do you wish to experience? Or is there something that you've dreamed about that didn't happen yet? That's a good question too, Joanne. Um, I have sort of willed people and experiences into my life. So the, the dreams that I've had along the way in my life, whether they be, you know, when I was young, like dreaming of playing and selling out Radio City Music Hall, which happened a couple times. Um, having a number one album, which happened, having a number one song, winning a Grammy, all those things that I sort of dreamed about, I would think about it in a way that really was a manifestation. And some of them took a while and some of them were happened really fast. Uh, same thing with people. There's a thread throughout this book. Um, I've just, I, I realized in the last, I don't know, five or six years really, that I've always had this ability to, uh, to manifest people and bring people into my life and into my path. And the same goes for experiences. Um, there's that great expression, which is the quality of your life is completely based upon the quality of your thoughts. So if you think negatively, you're going to have a negative life. And if you think, oh, that's never going to happen, it won't. But if you're always thinking positively in terms of like, I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to do that. I'm going to meet that person. I'm going to accomplish. You have a much better chance of pulling that off. Um, that's not only a theory. That's just a fact. I, I'm, I'm a testament to it. Um, let's see. Maxine from Manchester. From Greater Manchester. I didn't even know there was a thing. There's Manchester, but then there's Greater Manchester. That's where I want to go. Um, oh, she wants to know, when you wrote Hazard, did he kill Mary? I've always wanted to know. I'm not telling you, Maxine. I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you. I'm never telling. This is, I'm going to hold my secret of Hazard longer than Carly Simon held her secret for You're So Vain. Um, the answer to who killed Mary is your, whoever you think did it. You're correct. Um, Henry Key from Malaysia, best decision of your career. Best decision of my career. Huh. It's a really good question, man. Um, best decision of my career, actually, I would say happened nine years ago and was the basis of this book, which is when I started doing solo acoustic shows. I got to tell you, it scared the crap out of me, the idea of it. Up to that point, I had certainly done like chair. Like if I got invited to come and sing at a charity event and they'd say, hey, can you come and sing two or three songs? I would just bring a guitar or I'd sit at a piano to save on costs <clears throat> and also just, you know, no problem. I'll sing a few songs. But to do a show for two hours where it's just you, there's no band, was challenging for me as a musician. Um, I was insecure about my playing. Not, my, not so much my singing, because I've been singing forever. Um, but it was scary. 
And then when I started doing these shows, I felt so in love with it because it's so intimate and it's so just to hang with the audience. I, I talk a lot in my band show too, in between the songs. So I always want to make everybody feel like we're just hanging out. But when there are other people on stage, it's, it's a different dynamic. And when it's just me and the audience, it's so magical. And the gift that I gave myself by starting to do those shows is something that I will, I, I will do those kind of shows for the rest of my life as well as the band shows. The band shows are a blast because it's me and some great musicians and we're rocking out. And uh, I love the energy of that. But there is something for me as a performer that's so special about the solo acoustic shows. So I would say that that's been the best decision of my career, actually. Um, Mark from Sheffield wants to know, when you were younger, you had the privilege of working with a multitude of amazing artists who had a profound impact on you both professionally and personally. God, there were so many people. Um, the person who had the most profound impact on me was Lionel Richie, hands down. Uh, he changed my life. He, think about this. Lionel Richie, 1982. Um, arguably, maybe next to Michael Jackson, the biggest person in the music business. He's just about to leave the Commodores, his band, but he's already just massive. He's so huge and famous and respected. And Lionel Richie gets a cassette tape by some kid named Richard Marks. He's never heard of Richard Marks. He's this kid in Chicago. Lionel Richie takes the time to listen to this cassette tape. And then he actually sees that there's a phone number written in pencil on the back. And he calls the number just to tell this kid, Richard Marks, who he doesn't know, that he thinks that he's good. And then he said, you know, I think you got something, man. I think you should move out to LA. I think you should try it out there. Well, then when I, you know, a year later, when I do graduate from high school and move out to LA, then he ends up hiring me as a background singer on his first solo album. So now I have a, a resume immediately. And the only name on the resume is Lionel Richie, but Lionel Richie is the biggest artist in the world. So it was just, and then he introduced me to Kenny Rogers, who ended up recording some of my songs. And my songwriting career took off after that. It all comes back to Lionel. It all comes back to Lionel Richie, the most gracious, amazing guy. And I'm very happy to say that he and I are still in touch and we text each other and he just had a birthday a few weeks ago and he's just the best. He's sort of like, he was the sort of angel that came into my life and changed everything. So hands down, he, he had the most profound impact on me. Uh, yeah, forgetting the books. So here we are, if you're just joining us, Stories to Tell, a memoir by me, Richard Marks. Release today. It's book release day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I'm signing a few of these books while I answer some of your questions. Um, if you want to buy the book, it's in all the bookstores today, but you can also order it in the link below or anywhere if you get your books. Um, hang on. I'm going to sign two in a row because I'm on a roll. And we're this is going faster than I thought it would. I thought maybe this would be uh, dragging a little bit, but good questions, by the way. Thank you. Um, Julia from Worcester, Worcestershire. I'm thinking Worcester, Mass. No, Worcestershire, United Kingdom. Um, is there one person you'd love to duet with? There are a ton of people I would love to duet with. I would love to duet with Tovlo. The Swedish singer, I think she's amazing. I would love to duet with um, Bruno Mars, because I think he's the best singer on the planet right now. Um, I would love to duet with Dua Lipa, I think she's awesome. I would love to duet with anybody good. I've actually done quite a few duets uh, over the years including one with my dear friend, Olivia Newton-John. And there's a chapter in the book about my meeting and getting to know Olivia Newton-John that I think you'll find very entertaining. 
um, yeah, there are a lot of people out there. I'm always up for it. I'm always, you know, I love collaborating and I love singing with other people. And um, one of my favorite singers in the world is Patty Griffin. You guys know Patty Griffin, right? And I've never recorded a duet with her, but she was kind enough to come and do a charity event with me for cystic fibrosis. I've done a lot of uh, events for cystic fibrosis over the years. And Patty Griffin and I did a duet of Stop Dragging My Heart Around, the Tom Petty, Stevie Nicks duet. And holy crap, was that fun for me. God, that was fun. Um, Jeremy from New York. I uh, saw you and Matt Scannell in Rutland, Vermont in 2008. It was honestly the best show I've ever been to. Will you be touring together again or releasing another duo type album? Matt Scannell from the band Vertical Horizon is uh, one of my closest friends. He's like my little brother that I never had, although he's taller than me, but he's still my, my little brother. Um, one of the most talented people I've ever known. I was a huge Vertical Horizon fan. When that Everything You Want album came out, I wore that album out. I knew every every nuance of every minute of every note of that whole album. And then Matt and I, see, this is what I'm talking about. I just have this way of bringing people who've made an impact on me into my life. And so within eight months or so of me falling head over heels in love with that album, and it being my favorite album at that time, I meet Matt Scannell, the writer and singer of all those songs. And he and I became really close friends. And then about 10 years ago or more, yeah, you're right, it was, yeah, it's been a while. It's been like a dozen or 15 years. We started doing shows together as a, as a duo, acoustically. And those shows have been so fun. I do a song and Matt sings and plays with me. And then we do a Vertical Horizon song, we just take turns back and forth, but we talk and we laugh and it's such a great hang. And yes, we, we definitely wanna do more and more and more of that. Um, Matt and I wrote a, are, are in the middle of writing a new song for the Vertical Horizon project, which is almost finished. I mean, our song's almost finished. And I'm going back into the studio pretty soon to do a really cool project and Matt will definitely be a part of that. So yeah, as, as long as I'm in the music business, <laughs> Which will be till I draw my last breath. Matt Scannell will be somebody I work with and hang out with. He's the best. Oh wow, all this talking is making me parched. Um, Morgan from South Wales, Australia. I'm a massive fan of yours. Thank you. And Jeff Percaro. What was it like working with him? Jeff Percaro was the drummer in the band Toto, but he was also the drummer on so many famous records. From Michael Jackson's Beat It to, um, uh, oh, I Keep Forgetting by Michael McDonald. I mean, Jeff Percaro, if you look up the, the, the hit songs that Jeff Percaro played drums on, it's endless. Um, Jeff was a big part, okay, airplane. Jeff was a huge, sought after session musician in the 80s, especially when I was really coming up as a background singer. So I was getting a lot of work as a background singer for everybody from Chicago to Madonna to Julio Iglesias and Whitney Houston. And I sang on a bunch of different records. And there was a click, not a click, but there was a group of people who we all would see each other on these sessions. You know, Jeff Bacar would be playing drums on something with the, with the rhythm section. And when they were done and they were packing up and leaving, I would be coming in to sing background vocals on the same track. And so Jeff and I met and just hit it off. And I just loved hanging out, hanging around him. He, he had such a, he was just so cool. He was so cool to be around. It's hard to explain exactly why. He just had a really cool vibe about him. And he was insanely talented. And so when my career started to happen as an artist, um, of course, I wanted to work with Jeff, and he played on, I don't know, got to be, I don't know, six, seven, eight different tracks of mine, um, and working with him in the studio was just a joy, and he died way too young, and too, it was just pointless, um, and 
I think about Jeff all the time. I miss him a lot. And I, but I do think it's cool that even all these years, like he's, he died, I think, in 1992, I want to say. And I still have people come up to me and talk to, talk to me about Jeff Bacar. So he's got quite a legacy and uh, all the way to Australia. So that's really cool, Morgan. Um, let's see. Do you prefer writing? Oh, Diana from the United Kingdom. Do you prefer writing songs on your own or with other people? And who's been the most fun to write with? I couldn't tell you who's the most fun. Um, and the answer is I like both. I like, you know, I've written a, a, the overall percentage, higher percentage of my recorded songs I wrote by myself alone. But I love collaborating. I love co-writing. I don't really like collaborating with a bunch of people. I don't really do that thing. Um, at the most, it should be three people, and that's rare. If I co-write with somebody, it's usually just me and another person. Um, I've learned a lot from the people I've collaborated with and written songs with. Everyone from uh, Burt Backrack, the legend, to my son, Lucas. I've learned from both of them. And those experiences have been amazing. Writing with my son, and I'm actually in the process of I started to write a song with my youngest son, Jesse, which is really cool. It's a rock song. It'll be out on the next project. And I'm about to do some writing with my oldest son, Brandon, that's going to be a totally different kind of music. But Lucas, uh, my middle son, who's very sort of pop, R&B, very, like he writes, he wrote the, he co-wrote the new Katy Perry single called Electric. So he's really in the middle of what's happening in pop music right now. Writing with Lucas is fun because A, we're close. He's my son. He's very sarcastic. I don't know where he got that from. And um, he just keeps it moving. We just keep, there's, there's not a lot of like just sitting there and like thinking. There's always movement going on. He's always throwing out ideas and he's really fun to, to work with. Um, you know, I've written, I've, I've had some great success with Keith Urban. Uh, and I have such respect for Keith. I'm such a fan. I'm so happy for all his success. And the songs that we've written together that, that he's recorded, two of them went to number one on the country charts. One was called Better Life. The other was called Long Hot Summer. Um, and then we wrote another song that was top five for him called Everybody. And writing with Keith is an interesting, I write about this in the book, Stories to Tell, a memoir available today. Um, I write about working with Keith and he'll, I think he would be the first person to agree with me. Writing together, writing the music together of our songs is fun. Writing the lyrics together of our songs was not fun because we're both more musically driven. We're much, we have way more, uh, instant ideas for melodies and grooves and chord changes then we do lyrics which take both of us a long a longer time to come up with and just agreeing on the lyric sometimes would be laborious so we would all with the songs we've written together we wrote the music in like minutes we wrote better life the music to better life in 20 minutes and the lyrics took days in in different locations and and it's not even like the lyric is that profound. It's just that we couldn't find the right words with the right notes. It took a long time. So sometimes I write with people where the process is really like a grind. But as long as you get a great song out of it, I don't care. I'm willing to put in the work, you know. Um, Sonera from New Zealand wants to know, did I ever meet George and Michael? What do I think about George and Michael? She loves my song, Angel Leah. And what's the background of that song? Okay, well, I never met George Michael. I was a huge fan. I mean, who wasn't a George Michael fan? What a great voice. What a great songwriter. Really under, undervalued songwriter. Underrated. Um, and, you know, think about it. He wrote something so sort of poppy as Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. And then he wrote Father Figure within a few, couple of years of that. So he was a really, really talented man and a great singer. I never even got to see him live other than on TV. Daisy, my wife, 
talks about she went to see him in concert, um, not in the heyday, but maybe 10 years before he died. And she said it was one of the greatest shows she'd ever seen. And then he just, his command of the stage was just awesome. So yeah, I was a huge George Michael fan. Um, Angelia, uh, I wrote Angelia. I wrote most of Angelia in a, at a lunch in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, at a restaurant called Doyle's. I was having lunch with people from my record company there and they were talking and the music to Angelia came into my head. Even the, not the word, not the name, but some of the words, like where you run into now, where you run into now, came up, came as the music was coming in my head. Now, I was at lunch, so I didn't have that handheld cassette machine because that would be rude. So, and I write about this in the book, I had to do something else. I had to take matters into my own hands and I had to get creative so that I didn't forget that song. And if you want to know how I wrote that song, you can buy the book. All the stories to tell. And one of the stories I tell is how I wrote Angelia in Australia. Um, so you can check that out there. Uh, sorry, shameless plug. Um, Danilo, Dan, 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 Danilo from Italy, from Italy, uh, wants to know if I've ever taken vocal lessons and do I warm up before my shows? No and no. I've never taken vocal lessons. I take that back. I had one vocal lesson in my 30s because I was, um, my voice was getting hoarse a little bit when I was touring. So I thought maybe somebody could give me some uh, ideas or some exercises to keep it from doing that. It didn't really, I didn't really get anything out of that. Um, I don't warm up, but I don't really have any, other than that brief period in my 30s for like a year, I've never had any issues with my voice on tour. If I'm healthy, my voice is fine. The only time I've ever had any vocal stuff is if I get really sick, or if I get strep throat or something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's also, my voice is really raspy. You know, it's like somewhere between Rod Stewart and Brian Adams. And so that actually, when the, when the tone of your voice and the sound of your voice is sort of like sandpaper anyway, it's a little easier to sing through stuff that's going on. Um, sometimes, you know, my voice can be 100% great and I still sound like I'm hoarse because it's just I have a raspy voice. Uh, but no, I don't warm up and I don't, I've never really done any vocal lessons. I recommend it if it helps you, but Matt Scannell, for example, oh my God, he goes through a whole freaking 30 minute exercises warm up before the show. I'm trying to just, you know, sip my martini and look at my phone and all I hear is la 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 and I'm like, dude. But he hates that I don't warm up, so we're even. Um how old was I when I wrote my first song? And what was the name of the song? Maria wants to know from New South Wales. Um I was 15 and it's called The One You Need. And I wrote it because I had a massive crush on Lynn Harwich. I had a massive crush on Lynn Harwich for years. I met Lynn Harwich in kindergarten and we were, we were in the same class together for all through high school. And I'm still, I still am in touch with Lynn Harwich. She's one of the only people from my old school days who I hear from now and then. And when I play in the town where she lives, she and her family come to the show. Um, crush, I was crushing on her for years. And she never, uh, I was always in the friend zone. And she would only hang out with guys who were total douchebags. And uh, like, you know, 14, 15 year old douchebags, you know what I mean? And so I wrote, the first song I ever wrote, the lyrics were, I'm the one you need. Like, hello, hello, I'm the one you need. Apparently I wasn't, because it never, never happened. But that's, uh, that. I thank Lynn because that launched my songwriting. That's what started me writing songs. Um, 
what was the most challenging part of the story to write for you? How did the work come to the emotion? This is from Amanda from Saskatchewan. Uh, I love Saskatchewan. I've played there a couple of times. Beautiful part of the world. Um, that's a good question, Amanda. You know, the hardest thing to write about in the book for me was the death of my father. I lost my dad when, he, when I was 33, he was 73. Um, it was sudden and tragic and awful. And my father and I were not only incredibly and uniquely close as father and son, but we were best friends. I've, I've been close friends with both of my parents. Um, my mom is 85. She'll be 86, God willing, in, uh, and I say that I'm an atheist, but I always say God willing. Um, she'll be 86 in September. She's, she's having a lot of health issues and um, she's not doing well and that's hard. But going through the last couple of years with my mom, as many of you have dealt with um, parents, so, you know, where there's an illness and there's a, it's a long process. My father's was like that. It was like, it was so uh, awful. And I, I, I really suffered for a long time in the aftermath of it. And so writing about it in the book was painful because it brought up that grief. Um, but I hope that the writing of that chapter, which is called Through My Veins in the book, um, I hope it helps somebody. I hope it, if, if for no, like sometimes I remember when that was, when I was still really in the depths of grief, uh, sometimes I probably heard a story of, of someone who lost someone like that. It gave me a perspective and it, and it helped me in a, in a little way. So I hope that I do the same thing uh, for someone. There's also a really amazing, for, for those of you who are, who have just lost someone or, you know, feel like you're about to, there's an amazing poem ancient poem called Death is Nothing at All by Canon Henry Scott Holland. And I send that to people. Whenever somebody I know um, loses someone close to them, I send them a copy of that poem because it's, it's pretty amazing and powerful and helpful. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to be a downer, but that was the, uh, I needed to answer Amanda's question. Um, why, why did you choose that picture for your front cover? Oh, okay, so I made a joke that this picture was taken a couple weeks ago. This picture was taken in the back of a limousine and it, I don't know the town. I was on the repeat offender tour. Um, this has been doctored because there, there was a logo there from my old record company. Um, and it just looked ugly, so we took it away. But this was taken by a photographer named Alan Silfen, and he was actually a catalyst. He was one of the, he was the catalyst that made the call from Lionel Richie happen when I was 18. And Al Silfen, we call him Big Al, um, he's photographed Lionel for decades. He's photographed uh, Enrique Iglesias, Eric Clapton. He's a really, really great photographer, but he would just come out on the road with me and just shoot pictures. And we found this in some old archive and I just felt like I submitted this picture along with a few others and everybody at the publisher was like, that's, that's the book cover. So, and that hair, look at that hair I was happening. I mean, I'm, luckily I still have some, but uh, that was a whole other, a whole other hair experience. Um, Wait, this is upside down. What happened? See, I got one, one that needs to be, uh, needs to be, this is what it looks like without the cover, by the way. Isn't that nice? It's nice and classy. I'm really like kind of freaking out that I have a book. I can now, as soon as I end this with you guys, I'm gonna go to my, uh, all my social media and add the word author. I wouldn't, even though I wrote the book and I knew it was coming out, I refused to add the word author to my profiles until today, July 6th, because now I'm officially an author. And look at me, I'm signing my own book. All right, we're going to wrap, wrap it up here in a minute, but um, a couple more questions. Uh, my all-time favorite song is Wait for the Sunrise. This is from Michael in the Netherlands. Um, my all-time favorite song is Wait for the Sunrise, and I'm hoping you'll play that song next year when you're touring in Europe. 
to have you played that in recent concerts. I have not. I only played that song with the band a few times. I don't know why, because I really love that song too. Thank you for that. Um, I actually do mention that song in the book. Um, Wait for the Sunrise is a song from the Repeat Offender album. And I wrote it for, I was asked to write a song for the movie Tequila Sunrise, starring Mel Gibson and Kurt Russell and Michelle Pfeiffer. And the, the movie is about, Mel Gibson plays an ex-drug dealer who's trying to change his ways and go straight and get out of that life. And, um, and I really liked, they screened the movie for me. I liked the movie a lot. It's a good movie if you've never seen it. And so I wrote this rock song based upon Mel Gibson's character. And then when I gave them the song, they were like, no, it's a good song, but we were hoping you would give us a ballad. We want a ballad at the end of the movie. Uh, so I was like, yeah, you know what? No, thanks. Um, but then they found a ballad that I had written with my friend Ross Finelli that I had never recorded. And uh, I didn't want to sing a ballad in the movie, so they, but they took the song that I wrote with Ross called Surrender to Me, and it was recorded by the amazing Ann Wilson from Heart and the amazing Robin Zander from Cheap Trip. They did it as a duet, and it was a top 10 single. So that whole thing was kind of cool, but I ended up using Wait for the Sunrise on Repeat Offender, and I'll tell you what, dude, I will play it. Um, I'll put it into the set, because you, you, it's a good reminder. It's one of my favorite songs, and I, I don't play it live. I need to figure out a really cool acoustic version of it, too. Um, but yes, I will do Wait for the Sunrise. Okay, I'm gonna do two more questions and then we're gonna say goodbye. Um, Lene from Denmark, if you could choose one person or band to sing play with, someone not here anymore, who would you choose? Sam Cooke. I mean, I would immediately would love to get back to singing with my buddy Luther Vandross, but I, th I think you mean someone that I haven't already worked with. Um, Sam Cooke was my hero. If I could, could have worked with Sam Cooke, if I could have sung with Sam Cooke, if I could have just met Sam Cooke, that would have been, that would have freaked me out. So Sam Cooke, for sure. Um, Kathy from Carlsbad, California. No question, just wanted you to know I can't wait to read your book. Thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate that. Um, Okay, last question. I want to make it a good one. Um, who inspired you the most? This is from Marilea in Virginia Beach. Who inspired you to the, mo the most to follow your dream of becoming a singer-songwriter? Good question. It started with Elvis. And then, and also Davy Jones from the Monkees. He was a an early hero of mine. And there's, uh, I write about Elvis in the book a little bit, but I write a whole chapter about Davy Jones because Davy Jones, uh, you have to read the book. The story about Davy Jones alone is it's one of my favorite stories that ever happened to me. It's one of my favorite stories I tell people. Um, it's the chapter called I Want to Be Free, which is a song that the monkeys did. And it's the first song I ever sang in front of anyone when I was in my kindergarten class and I was asked to get up and sing a song and I sang this monkey song, I Want to Be Free, because I worshiped Davy Jones. Later on, it was Sam Cooke and uh, Paul Simon and some other songwriters, artists, songwriter artists who inspired me the most. Um, but the list of people who have influenced me and inspired me is way too long. Uh, I couldn't even begin to go down the list. I just feel really fortunate that I got to work with quite a few of them. So uh, good question. Thank you guys for the questions. The books are signed. You can get, you can still get your book uh, if you click on the link uh, below. And thanks for hanging out with me for an hour. I'm going to go up, you know, it's release day. So there's a lot going on today. So I'm going to run. But thank you guys for joining me. And I'll see you guys on Facebook and elsewhere. And uh, stay safe and healthy. All right. Thanks again. See you.